Okay, so last day I mentioned that there were a number of different types of stars, go from T to O type stars. And basically the difference between these stars is the surface temperature, which depends basically on their mass, but also on their metallicity. The metallicity means the amount of other elements heavier than hydrogen they have in their interior. So our sun is a G-type star, and uh, they, are, they make up only about 7.6% of all the stars in our galaxy. M-type stars, which are the red dwarfs, are by far the most common type stars. But in fact, we rarely see red dwarf stars unless they're very close to us. So in fact, most of the stars in our galaxy, we do not see with the naked eye, but you can see them with telescopes. Um, there are also F-type stars, which are a little bit larger and hotter than our sun. They make up about 3%, and A-type stars, which make up about 0.6%. The other stars are, are very small proportion B and O-type stars, and in fact, their lifetimes are very short, so they would not make good suns for planets with life, because life at least wouldn't have much time to develop. It may develop pigments, and uh, maybe even complexes of different pigments, but it would not be enough time to develop, for example, cellular life on planets of these stars, B and O type, because their lifetimes are just too short. The greater the mass of the star, the, the faster the nuclear reactions which are occurring in its interior, and so the faster that the, the star finishes its life, and these type of stars would end up with a supernova explosion at the end of their lives. Uh, then I mentioned that there was this James Webb telescope, which will be put into orbit about three times the distance of the moon from Earth. And uh, it has this shield, which shields it from the infrared uh, light, which is coming off the moon, the Earth, and our sun. And it will be looking basically in the infrared at uh, different stars, these uh, M-type stars, these red dwarf stars. Um, and also be looking at uh, redshifted galaxies, um, which are very redshifted because they're very far from us. So they are the first formed galaxies in the universe, which have a very high redshift. In fact, these galaxies can be receding from us at a velocity greater than the velocity of light in vacuum. And that may sound strange, but that's due to the expansion of the universe. So they have, they're extremely uh, redshifted galaxies, but some of them will become visible, not all of them, of course, but some of them, I think to about 100,000 years after the Big Bang, those galaxies which formed within that time range, well, after 100,000 years, uh, will be visible to this telescope. Uh, I also mentioned that in the case of R, thermodynamic dissipation theory for the origin of life. Instead of talking about habitability, we talk rather about thermodynamic viability. And uh, for life to be occurred through dissipative structuring, the criteria which we require for the planet is that we have liquid water, because water is a good solvent. And secondly, it's also good for dissipating the energy, when you excite a molecule and it goes to its first electronic excited state, that molecule can decay through what's called the conical intersection to the ground state by um, dissipating the electronic excitation energy into heat. And uh, so, we, so water is also good for dissipating. So there are a couple of reasons where, why water is very important. Liquid water is very important for life. So we need a temperature range for the surface of the planet in which we can assure that liquid water exists. We also require a magnetic shield. That means that we have a core which is not yet frozen. For example, Cricket on Mars, the, the core of Mars is frozen. And so Mars has a very weak magnetic field. And that means that the particles which are emitted from the sun 
can destroy the atmosphere because a magnetic field normally confines the particles to, to the, the polar regions. So it's important that we have a magnetic shield for life to occur. And that we also have a continuous supply of photons in the UVC plus UVB region, the spectrum. And uh, we also require that we have short wavelength UVC in the upper atmosphere. We need short wavelength radiation in the, up, uh, the upper atmosphere to produce molecules like hydrogen cyanide or, um, well, ammonium, which we'll see is very useful for producing uh, other chemicals in life like uh, formamide and uh, then for producing the bases, the other bases besides adenine and guanine. Um, we need the long wavelength UVC on the surface. Remember that we needed it on the surface, this long wavelength UVC, and this is the range from about 210 to 280 or 285 nanometers. And this is useful for the dissipative structuring, the dissipative proliferation and dissipative evolution. Um, we also require medium wavelength uh, UVC range, okay. Uh, well, no, we, we don't require this on the surface. If there's any medium, if there's any UVC light lower than about 210 nanometers on the surface, then we're going to be ionizing these molecules and we will slowly destroy them which is probably what has occurred on the surface of Mars. And that's why that maybe in the past, if there has been life on the surface of Mars, today it would not be visible because of this UVC destruction or wavelengths, which are less than about 210 nanometers. We also said that we need a high surface temperature, about 85 degrees centigrade, which is about the denaturing temperature of short strand DNA. And our RNA has a little lower surface temperature. So in fact, in our scenario of the dissipative structuring of life, it is more probable that DNA came before RNA. Although many of you have heard about the RNA um, world in which it was supposed that RNA came first because not only does it contain information or hold information, it can also act as a self catalyst or such things as like uh, breaking certain sections and for uh, fomenting the formation of, of a complementary strand. Uh, but RNA has a lower denaturing temperature depending on its length, but about 35 to 50 degrees centigrade. So we probably assume that if RNA occurred through this dissipative structuring, then it was probably occurring at the poles where the surface temperature was colder. So even though we're saying that we need a, an average surface temperature about 85 degrees centigrade, of course, that is not a fixed temperature over the whole of the, the ocean surface. At the poles, it's going to be colder and at the equator, warmer. It would also help if we have the urinal cycling which means a day and night cycling process because that helps us with this UV tar process, which is the, the physical mechanism of replicating DNA and RNA without enzymes because we could not imagine that we had uh, these complicated enzymes existing at the origin of life. And it was also important that we had gradual cooling of the earth because that allowed us to go below the denaturing temperature, and then using ultraviolet light to allow the separation of double strand into single strand during the daytime. So besides the criteria which are necessary in the traditional uh, theories for the origin of life, which are like water, liquid water on the surface mag magnetic shield, uh, they don't require ultraviolet radiation 
In fact, they assumed that ultraviolet radiation would be harmful to the origin of life. And that's why some theories like uh, the vent, hydrothermal vent theories of the origin of life are popular because uh, it's assumed that at that depth, there would be no ultraviolet radiation arriving and therefore life would be protected. But we see that we really need ultraviolet radiation on the surface of Earth in order to produce these first fundamental molecules of life, which were pigments in the UVC. Okay, then we gave an example of how to measure the absorption spectrum of the atmosphere, and from that determine on planets which are uh, extrasolar, which exist on other stars, how we could determine uh, if there existed biosignatures in the atmosphere of these star of these planets on these stars. And these biosignatures could be, for example, like oxygen or methane or ammonium, typical molecules or products which life produces today, which our kind of life produces. So looking for biosignatures to measuring the absorption spectrum, which they have a difficult time doing if it's not a red dwarf, because if it's any larger star than a red dwarf, the light from the star is, is too, too strong for the size of the planet. And uh, therefore, we don't see uh, a very nice absorption spectrum. There's a lot of noise. So they're looking for red dwarf stars first. But because of the fact there is no ultraviolet light on those red dwarf stars, you know, there's, no, there's none of this peak here in the UVC range, it is very unlikely that those stars, those planets of those stars, would harbor life, if our theory is correct, of course, no? So what we really need is this range of the UVC from about 210 to about 285. And we see that on Earth, this peak existed for 1,000 million years. That is a billion years it existed on the surface, all during the Archean and even before the Archean. So this light was around for a very long time. So if life was actually on the surface of Earth for that period from about 3.85 thousand million years ago to about 2.8 thousand million years ago, if there indeed existed life, which we assume that there was because we have evidence for fossil, even fossil evidence those times, then this life must of course have been at least uh, adapted to this UVC light because it existed for such a long time, a thousand million years. So it's hard to imagine why life would not uh, take advantage of this ultraviolet light, UVC light, if it was around for that time, because it's very useful light. It has just the energy which is needed for uh, bond reformation, carbon covalent bond re reformations. So this is what we requiring for the origin of life like our own on other planets of other stars. And we see that if we plot the maximum absorption of these different fundamental molecules of life, they coincide with this UVC peak around 280 to 210 nanometers. So that is a good indication that uh, they were in fact pigments at the origin of life. Now they have completely different purposes or functions, but at the origin of life, there were pigments which were dissipating because dissipation is in fact the fundamental uh, reason for the existence of any irreversible process. And life, of course, is an irreversible process. Okay, so, so then we talked about the distribution of the spectrum, or well, the spectrum is a function of intensity on the y-axis, and the number of photons or an energy on the y-axis, and the wavelength on the x-axis. And our sun is this yellow line. And uh, the F-type stars is this line, and this is the A-type star line. 
So these stars have more ultraviolet light because they are hotter. So this is just a black body spectrum at a given temperature. Knowing the temperature of those type of stars, their average temperatures, we can plot a black body spectrum and find out what kind of ultraviolet light was arriving. This is at the top of the atmosphere. Now, if we assume that uh, we have planets like Earth on these other stars, and that these planets have atmospheres, like the atmosphere on our own Earth at the origin of life, then these are the spectra that we would see here. Okay, this here in yellow is our solar spectrum. This is what we had on Earth. And this is for the F and the A type stars. Uh, and you can see there's a lot more of this UVC light. So that could be a good thing, but we have to be careful that we don't have any of this medium wavelength UVC light because this light can begin to ionize the molecules. In fact, we do have a significant quantity of this life for uh, stars which are of the A type. So it's highly improbable that A type stars would produce these kinds of molecules. But we can have F type stars. Now, these other stars, uh, M type stars, have no light in this UVC range. So therefore, there wouldn't be any, any light. But uh, there are some other stars which do have a little bit. Uh, it's called the K type star which you can see it just here down below. The K-type star does have a little bit of UVC light. So there may be life also on K-type stars. There's certainly life on G-type stars because we have evidence for it on Earth and maybe on F-type stars, but probably not on A-type stars. Okay, and this was just a graph of showing how the pigments today absorb is a function of wavelength. So this is the function of wavelengths here in micrometers. So this is 0 0.3 is 300 nanometers. That's in the getting in getting close to the UVC range. Here, this graph ends at about 2.8 or 280 nanometers. But uh, if you extend it all the way down to 210, you see that life. This line. This is the absorption of different uh, leaves, which contain different pigments, the absorption is very strong, about 90%, all the way down to about 210 nanometers. So we're absorbing very strongly over this whole range, and that's due to all these other pigments, which are in besides chlorophyll, which exist in the leaves of the plants on Earth, and also in the cyanobacteria, which are floating on the ocean. So that could be a, an, a, an interesting project for you and Andres. Now we get all of a sudden a, a big drop at about 700 nanometers. This 0.7 here, this 0.7 microns is 700 nanometers. And this is called the red edge. And this has been somewhat of a mystery. Many people claim that it was due to the, there are just no, uh, this is between the electronic excited state and when we start to excite the vibrational states of the molecule. And this is the gap between them. But in fact, there is no such gap. It's a figment of the biologist's imagination. We know, in fact, that there are pigments which absorb in this range, which is called the red edge, even though the, the pigments in plant leaves don't absorb in this range here. We know that there are pigments in cyanobacteria which are found at the bottom of the oceans, which are near hydrothermal vents, which do absorb in this range. So the, the solution of the biologists that this red edge is due to the fact that between the electronic excitation states and the vibrational states of the molecule, there's a gap. This is, this is not true. So we have to come up with another explanation for this red edge. And that is, in fact, one of the homework assignments which I gave to you. Because, in fact, the pigments have a finite lifetime when they're in their excited state. And when they are in their excited state, they cannot absorb another photon. So, therefore, we have to wait until the excited state is dissipated into heat before absorbing another photon. 
And the pigments also have a finite size. They're not infinitely small. They have a size. And that means you can only pack a certain amount into, into, into the leaf, into a surface area. So you can do the calculation and it turns out quite nicely, you know, given the intensity of the sunlight, which is about 10 to the 22 photons per square meter at the surface of Earth, you can do the calculation and showing that if you're absorbing about 90% of the light which is falling on the leaf, and, um, and that there are 20, 10 to the 22 photons per square meter on Earth's surface, then, and given the, the lifetimes of these pigments, the average lifetimes, they all have different lifetimes depending on their conical intersections. But given that information, you can calculate that the, the most they could do is absorb and dissipate up to about 700 nanometers because there is just not enough space available and their lifetimes are not short enough to be able to dissipate further into the infrared. And it is this part, in fact, of the spectrum, which is the greatest entropy producing part, because these are high energy photons, so they carry a very low entropy. And so dissipating these high energy photons into infrared light would make more sense than dissipating these infrared photons into further infrared photons. So we get a lot more dissipative capacity here, and that's why life started dissipating in the ultraviolet and then gradually increasing with the advent of more pigments until reaching the red edge, which is it is at now. So uh, as I mentioned that there are some cyanobacteria which do have pigment, pigments in this range. Well, um, they, they exist, those pigments, because they are in cyanobacteria which are at the bottom of the ocean surface where there's not this high flux of incident solar light so therefore, they are, we don't, we're not saturating the system. So therefore, we can have pigments in this range with a very low light. But if we have 10 to the 22 photons per square meter, then that is too much. And so we just don't have the, the finite size. We can't make the, the pigments any smaller to be able to, to complete the absorption. So that's why we have the red edge on the surface for the surface plants, but for deep underwater, we have pigments which do in fact extend into this region. And as we go to lower uh, wavelength regions, farther into the infrared, this is where we get water starting to absorb again. Okay, so this is why we have this dip here in the spectrum, and this is why we have the red edge. Okay, so I just mentioned then, uh, just to give a summary, well, there are a number of processes which require short wavelength UVC light, like for example, the formation of hydrogen cyanide in the upper atmosphere and the, the formation of ribose. And so uh, this light is important, but only in the upper atmosphere. If we have it on the surface, then we're going to be destroying these carbon-based uh, molecules, which are these like uh, nucleic acids for, for the, dissipative structuring of these nucleic acids, amino acids, lipids, and so on, we need long wavelength ultraviolet light, which is in the 210 to 285 nanometer range. Also, we need this range of uh, light for the phosphorylation. That means adding on these three phosphate groups, and that gives the system the ability to, to form other bonds using, this is like ATP if this was adenine, for example. So it's like an energy storage unit. We also need this UVC light in the long wavelength range for this UV tar, this replication mechanism, and uh, for proliferation and for the production for my chirality, which I didn't get into much detail, but uh, maybe we have a chance to talk about it uh, another time. And also for evolution, that means, for example, the formation of complexes of different molecules, different fundamental molecules, such as tryptophan and uh, DNA. Um, but we don't want any medium uh, wavelength UVC 
on the surface because this can also cause ionization, just as short wavelength UVC light on the surface could cause ionization. So then we looked at these different star types and uh, noted their average temperatures. And then we determined the distance that they would have to be, the planets would have to be from the stars in order to have liquid water. Because remember, we need liquid water for a solvent and also for the dissipating substance. And uh, so these are the different distances. For, so for M-type stars, this is in astronomical units. That is the distance of the Earth from the sun. So for M-type stars, the planet, planet like Earth would have to be at, uh, at about 0.16 of the distance of the Earth from the Sun, 0.16 astronomical units. And for uh, other stars which are larger than the Sun, they would have to be further out. So this is a problem for M-type stars because if the planet has to be so close, then we could get this tidal locking and only one face of the planet uh, is facing star. So one face would be very warm and the others in the, in the backside would be very cold. And it would be highly unlikely that the planet had an atmosphere because these M-type stars are very, uh, because of their type of convection, which is going on uh, on the surface, it's actually convection of the whole star. So it's bringing a lot of very high energy particles to the surface and emitting them into space. So this has a, these M-type stars have very strong solar winds and that would destroy basically the atmospheres of a planet like Earth at this distance from the M-type star especially if it didn't have any magnetic shielding. So at these distances then, when we have liquid water, this is just a calculation of what would be the surface flux in watts per meter squared on the surface, where they're integrating the whole spectrum. And so this is about the same. This is what we, this is the idea to have them about the same so that we have liquid water on the surface. And this, uh, this gives the portion in the long wavelength UVC. This is the good light, remember, that we need. And this gives us the watts per square meter. So we have about five watts per square meter on Earth at the origin of life. And a very small amount for M-type stars and a large amount for F-type stars and greater. No? And uh, this is the amount of uh, medium UVC light that we would find on the surface. And uh, so we see that for F-type and A-type stars, we have a lot of this light on the surface. So we could start to compare to Earth, no? which is the G-type star here. So we could start to ionize. So we may not have any of these molecules, these carbon-based molecules. And this is the short wavelength light, which we need in the upper atmosphere to produce these molecules like hydrogen cyanide and ammonia. We see again that for F and A type stars, we have a lot of this light, so we get a lot of production, so that's good. But the bad part is that we have medium wavelength also on the surface, not negligible. So that can cause destruction. And these were just ionization plots we see here, and this is for cytosine and dimine. So starting at about 200, what is that? Two, no, 160 nanometers, we get uh, ionization in this region, very strong ionization. Okay, so then we went to calculation for the probability of life arising on a given star or a given star type. Assuming that we had a theory like uh, the thermodynamic dissipation theory for the origin of life, what would be the probabilities that life could arise on these other type stars? Assuming that the probability for life arising on the sun is one, so we normalize everything to the sun, which is one, no? So how do we determine that probability? Well, there are many ways of going about doing it, and we can have an argument about which is the best way. But after thinking about it for some time, I came up with this equation in which we determine the number of independent dissipative structuring, proliferation, evolution processes, which are necessary, for example, using this long wavelength UVC light. So we raise that to the power of six because there are six independent processes. For ionization, it's only one process, so we, and it's a negative process because it causes destruction of the molecules. So we raise it to the minus one here in this formula. And for shortwave, this is good radiation as long as we have it only on, in the upper atmosphere. 
So it's a positive and it comes in as a one because we have just uh, dissipative structuring processes here, not these other processes involved. So this is an equation, it's a very rough equation, probably doesn't have too much significance, but at least generally it should describe more or less what are the probabilities of having life on different planets, on different, on, on planets of different star types. Okay, and we also multiply it by the age of the star. Because as I said, these very big stars like the A and F type stars have short lifetimes. Like A type star has 370 million years, 